see my face the first thing. It's gonna surprise the fuck out of him. Nice. Alrighty. Looks like we're up and running. Happy April Fool's Day. It is rainy as heck outside and it's a little distressing because I decided to go to the farmer's market first thing this morning. So, it was very, very warm, very, very cold. Very, very warm. This is very, very warm. And it was very, very cold. So, I'm shifting it over. Making sure that everything is fitting the way it needs to and I can see how many concurrent viewers I have. Awesome, awesome. I doubt a lot of people are going to be joining us today, but you never know. I am going to hop in Discord, though, because I had been made aware that apparently some of... Oh, no, I don't want to auto-mod. That sounds dirty when you say it that way. Alright, um, I've been made aware by one of my old compatriots in the English program at my college that they would enjoy possibly participating in this. So, um, I shall give them the opportunity to do so if they so wish. But there's no guarantees, and I highly, highly doubt it, honestly. Just because everyone has their own things to do, I do this because I enjoy it and I want to talk about books, but I have no one to talk about books with. So, this is how this came to be. Welcome to the stream and or uh, recording, depending on where you're at. You can call me PK, which is short for Potato Night, but please call me PK. And um, I do participate in some gaming, but uh, pri the primary purpose of this channel is slowly but surely turned into books, and uh, fantasy books primarily. So what this means is that every Saturday I will take about an hour, maybe two or three, and I'll go ahead and do a deep dive on books that I have read, books that I'm currently reading. This one is almost done, but um, I have read it before, so wanted to go ahead and reread it before talking about it and uh, at least get to a point where I remember the ending. I will, will try not to spoil the ending. On occasion, I will spoil certain things, and it's, just believe me when I say that it's purely unintentional. That's never my goal. But this is just kind of a relaxed thing that I uh, that you can participate in if you so wish. If you've read this book or if this book reminds you of something, if there's any kind of instance where you think that this might re that this might have a good that this might have a uh, an interesting another book that you would like to read and talk about at length, I'd be more than happy to actually take a look. There is no. There's no guarantees that I will do it because I don't, I refuse to read things that honestly I don't believe are worth my time. I made a short about this recently where someone made mention that I should do Fifty Shades of Grey and uh, I said no because it, there, there's nothing that I want to glean from that book. There isn't. Just based strictly off of the premise. But let's not get off topic here. So last week we did Empire of Silence. And I am gonna do a part two, but I need to go. I need to go back through the ending of that book because it, I remember vaguely how the details go, but I don't want to give away. Honestly, there's gonna be things that I'm gonna miss. Honestly, there's going to be things that I should have gone over and I didn't. This is, you know, a purely imperfect way of doing this. If I if I did ever get the idea that I was gonna do fully edited content with around the books as opposed to the edited content I do now, then that is going to be a lot more well researched and so I'm actually providing good information. This is more of just talking about it, talking it out, talking about its problems, talking about what you what you could probably see as a way to improve certain things. Is different 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 uh I'm hearing talking and it's throwing me off. Different pathways that are not often tread, let's say that. And, or if they are often tread, we're treading them again. You know, there's a reason why they're pathways. So, a uh, book that we're going to be talking about today is this one. It's called The Aeron Aeronaut's Windlass. I'm, you see, here's the issue is I've always just called it The Aeronaut's Windlass, and because a windlass is in this particular juncture, I'm not positive if, if it's actually in reference to a an actual boat but yeah so windless based off of this is a cinch it looks like 
yeah, it's a crank or some of some sort. In this book, a windlass is actually something completely different. What a windlass is, is it is a essentially a barge of some sort in this. So context to this story. This story is set in a time where the surface of whichever planet that they're on, there is no confirmation that it's Earth or not. There is an assumption, though, because there is a Christian religion that is fluctuating throughout the uh, throughout the main area of attention and the surface of the planet is uninhabitable. So all of Earth's humans live in these gigantic spires, which essentially are different countries. They all operate with different rulers. They all operate under different types of government. And the main one that you are focusing on in this book is called Albion. Albion is the, uh, so that one is actually ruled by a, what is called a spire arch or a spire arc and it's been, it's kind of classified as one of the most prosperous spires in the series. The way that they indicate prosperity in this, which I actually kind of enjoy because it's, it's something that you can kind of extrapolate based off of a overly consumptive society, is that it's going to result in things that we acknowledge as common as ending up not so common and becoming very valuable. In this, it's wood. So as an example, a wood door would probably... If based off of the context and based off, of, they don't actually use real units, you, real, real units of currency. So you have to just kind of guess based off of that. So if I had a guess, it probably a door, a wooden door would cost around the same amount as a probably one bedroom apartment, you know? So that is one of those, that is one of those things that they do indicate. And so there's Spire Albion, they make mention of even in the poorest areas, they have access to wood to build structures. So the, so yeah, Spire is definitely, uh, Spire Albion is one of the richer ones. Now, this is where things get complicated because this is written from the, uh, this is written in a third person omniscient point of view. For those of you who do not know what that means, third person omniscient means that the reader has an outstretched view and understands the things that are going on based off of the fact that you're seeing it from all these different perspectives. You don't know everything that's going on, but you know everything that's going on in your realm, in, in your universe, essentially. Everything, everything that the characters know, you know, but there's a significant number of characters creating a full picture around it. So not pure omniscience. Pure omniscience is that you're very basically just hovering at a three feet above every character and you're watching everything happen. And then you also know what what's going on in the in the world around it in order to make these things happen. So I would say that one of the critiques is, and then you learn this very, very quickly, is that there are a lot of quote unquote main characters to keep track of in this book. I'm not saying that's a disqualifier and, but speaking to people who don't read a lot of books that are not that uh, speaking to people who read a lot of books that are just focused on one character and then you learn the story th through that character essentially this can be a bit of a culture shock and this is not to disgrace them i'm just saying that it can be very difficult to keep track of a lot of these people they thankfully thankfully jim butcher has a tendency to use more common names not not common names but names that you that names that aren't going to throw you so as an example if you are reading Lord of the Rings for the first time. There's a person called Aragorn. There's a person called Eowyn, Arwen, you know, uh, Arwen, Elrond. It's going all these. It's going through all of these names, and it can get a bit frustrating, probably, to keep track of everyone. So, as an example, when I was a kid, Eowyn and Arwen, I could, oh, I always got those two confused because, especially considering that they're both women too, and in the, since the names are so similar, the characters are so vastly different, but. A similarity in names was always throwing me off so thankfully that is not an issue here and one of the characters is also a cat so it's not necessarily an extremely difficult thing it's not it's not extremely difficult to keep track of right in that regard but what I will say is on average I think the most I've ever read from the point like most I've ever had point of view wise in a book is probably three and that's three characters all of whom are essentially in the same space so you're not keeping track of 
you're not you're not trying to keep track of multiple different people with multiple different motivations all in different locations that's where things start to get a bit complex and a bit fuzzy so in this I, hold on i have to go all the way through it so gwen uh bridget grim raul uh aspera and i want to say that there's one more but think and thankfully the um there's certain ones that disappear but there's other ones that reappear so as an ex as an example the um who is it it was aspera who works for uh a, an opposing spire right is a um he appears halfway through the book because obviously he as a member of an opposing spire you actually don't realize who he is or understand what part he's going to play until you meet him so there is that there is that but it can get very confusing because they're literally spread out over everywhere and then you're learning certain details that about what happened to these characters from the point of view of another character so when you start compounding that and then you are you are drip fed details it can get very uh it can just get very easy to misunderstand what exactly is trying to be portrayed but like i said one of the characters is a cat and you also have to write the point of view of that cat and he does and jim butcher does a very good job of doing so where all he's doing is uh the cat assumes that they are better than everyone else as everyone who knows who has cats and owns cats knows that is definitely a part that is definitely something that they're going to participate in every cat assumes that they're better than their owner and as they should they that's their realm right so you're not getting confused by that point of view but the issue is is that in order to maintain that level what that's going to require is description of activities from that point of view using those words that they find common as an example the uh the cat the cat tells differences between people by giving them nicknames and when he doesn't have nicknames he'll always put the word human in front of a name so it starts to compound it and become a little bit arduous of a read okay so that's probably one of my bigger pet peeves with this there's it, 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 the pet pe the issues that i have with it are broken into two but i'm going to actually start with so let's go let's go ahead and go for the second one and then i'm going to go deeper into this at, later when we're actually going through the story so the second issue that i have with this is any time you can you can have a purpose for someone being quirky or acting in a certain way or behaving a certain way and and it can be intriguing and fun but there is a there is a part of this book that seems very uh quirk for the sake of quirk right so they oh so like I said, let's go. Uh, let, let's go through the story, and then when I get to these characters in particular, I will say so. So uh, I'll I'll go ahead and dive deeper into that one. So the the beginning part of this book, you actually are following a captain of who I'm assuming the artist was trying to capture on here on the front. His name is Captain. Uh, his name is Captain Grimm. Mattis, Francis Madison Grimm, uh, Hawthorne Grimm, or it's Francis, Francis Madison Grimm at least. And he is a privateer, and he is currently in pursuit of a merchant vessel in order to take it down for the spire that he currently works for, which is Spire Albion. Spire Albion is, uh, so he, it, they make mention at the very early parts of it where they are going, where someone asks him, oh, well, this is not exactly fleet. And he makes mention that he got drummed out of the fleet. So very minimal details given at the very beginning. They do make mention at later that he got drummed out because he was uh, because of cowardice, which is just kind of strange. They never really fully de delve deep into that because he doesn't like talking about it, which is fine. And they do give some details, but the actual part, the cowardice part of it is odd. And they don't really go full in on that particular detail, at least at the time. So as part of this, he's ch like I said, he's chasing after the merchant vessel, ends up running across a gigantic not a freighter, a gigantic battleship, the equivalent of a battleship, and then has has to make a hasty exit. As part of the hasty exit, he ends up damaging his ship rather badly. And then he takes it all the way back to his home base, and then 
Uh, and then this is when things start, like I said beforehand, things start to get a little bit more complex and start weaving in and out of certain things, weaving in and out of certain details. So first and foremost, this flips to Gwen, another character, Gwendolyn Lancaster, upper level, uh, upper level member of the, <clears throat> sorry, upper level of the nobles. She is, uh, her family is in charge of a vattery. Now, a vattery in this realm is you essentially get to grow certain things. So as an example, you grow meat in this, in, in this universe. I need to fi figure out a consistent way of saying it. In this universe, you can grow meat, you grow, and the one thing that the Lancasters grow, which makes them such a powerful family, is they grow power crystals. The ability to actually harness energy and then use it to elevate ships, use it to actually produce lights and energy of and, and of that nature and especially considering that wood is so expensive you definitely don't want to use two in this realm you definitely don't want to use too much wood to burn fire right so you have to come up with a different way to do so <clears throat> a different way to light everything i'm so sorry i saw how many people were here and i started freaking out got to be honest. Welcome. I'm just discussing one of my favorite books and uh, if you have anything to add, please add it. I, uh, If you know anything about this book, it's a really fun read and I definitely want to get other people's perspectives on it because I have things that I love about it and I have things about, that I hate about it and the one thing that I definitely love about it before I delve deeper into the story is that the aesthetic, I love the steampunk aesthetic. It's one of my favorites. I love airships. I love any kind of uh, I love any kind of usage of Tesla coils, copper, any anything anything of that nature. And this uses that aesthetic to their advantage so much that it's it's very easy to delve into and start ignoring the details that can kind of hurt the book. So, like I said, I was talking about Gwendolyn Lancaster. Gwendolyn Lancaster, their family is in charge of the battery that grows these power crystals that allows these ships to make these long journeys and allows electricity to be used throughout these spires. And so, as a result, they are very expensive, and as a result of that, they became very wealthy. So, she acts as a normal noble woman would act, but the one thing that they definitely do as part of this is anyone who is part of a family that is of noble background, those people need to join the guards. And she is set to join the guards even though she doesn't have to and everyone always says that it's an outdated tradition she wants to so points in her court but of course as part of that she becomes not not as part of her joining but as part of her being a noble she becomes kind of an aggravating character because she kind of needs to be she needs to be a brat that gets kind of put in her place in a way so pretty standard uh character character trait track if you can bear with me there where it ends with her essentially fully understanding the amount of being uncomfortable, the amount of being put in compromising positions that you're not used to, that her, that her being part of the guards is going to do. So, you meet her. She, there is a bit of an interesting interaction with her and her mother. That's at the, this is actually at the very, very beginning. And uh, she ends up making quite the exit from her, uh, from her family's house in order to make it to being one of the guards. Alongside of this, we end up find like I said, there's a lot of characters. Alongside of this, you end up meeting another one of the main characters. Her name is Bridget. Oh, sorry. Bridget Tagwin. Tagwim or Tagwin. I can't remember if it's an M or an N. And what that what she is also a member of one of these families, but like normal and average families of any of any particular long-standing empire or long-standing kingdom not every noble is looked upon as favorably and not every noble is in charge of something that would make them viewed upon as high level so she her family is in charge of a meat battery and so she does something that's very very important and this actually leans into something that i believe in where not a lot of people fully appreciate or understand that where their food comes from so of course she ends up getting disgraced but she still wants wanting to support her family goes and joins the guards as well which is fantastic, and I actually kind of love her in a way, but the other part of this that's kind of frustrating is that, again, you have to get all the way through the book before it fully occurs to her that she is in an extremely dangerous situation. And then she has a tendency to put her foot in her mouth a couple of times that just doesn't seem to track with what she's learning. So, you would again, at the very beginning of a book, 
At the, and, and I get that he wants to extend this out into a series. As far as I'm aware, I, I haven't heard hide nor hair of the, when the next Cinder Spires book is supposed to come out. I haven't really been keeping track of it. Or if, if it's even out. Let me look. Upcoming works. Here we go. So the next book... Yeah, the... Uh, it says the Cinder Spires number two is on is currently being written by Jim Butcher, but he there is no plans on when an actual release date is. So I'm hoping that he kind of delves a little bit further into Bridget's character because she gets put in the most precarious positions where you would have to grow or die super quickly. So there's not a hell of a whole lot of growth that encourages me to continue reading just strictly for her. So, but overall, I do love her character. My favorite character by far is definitely, probably, not definitely, probably Grimm, the, uh, the, the captain that I brought up before, just because he is, there's a lot to know about him and there's a lot to learn about him, but he operates in such a way that he feels a responsibility to everyone under his charge, even though he's not technically part of the government. There, there, um, he, as in, as in his training sticks around for such a long time that even when he's just a privateer, it, and which technically to every other spire is a pirate, that he still maintains this level of, I don't want to destroy anyone who's not a combatant. I don't want to cause any unnecessary loss of life. All I want to do is make is continue to make money, and then if if need be, I'm going to protect the things that I love. So later down the book, where where his services are called upon, he doesn't question it. He just runs and he just does it, which makes him quite an interesting and almost lovable character in a brash way. And uh, so, like I said, Gwen, Bridget. Uh, Madison Grimm, there is, so, and, oh, it's Folly. Folly is that last character. So, as part of meeting Bridget, you meet one of her companions, which is Rao. Rao's a cat. And so Jim Butcher does write from the perspective of said cat. And it's, he does such a good job because cats, I can't even imagine having to delve into what you would think a cat would think of a human. It requires so much time and effort to just sit there and watch cats and understand how they react to certain things. And so it's not, and it's not even going to YouTube and typing in cute cat videos. You literally have to watch a cat and understand how they move, how they act, how they interact with each other. So as an example, later in the book, you find out how two cats, so cats are associated by tribe. So you find out later in this book how two tribes create communication between the two of them and it starts and all it is is them sh showing deference by ignoring the other cat and this can take anywhere from 30 minutes to days where all they're doing they're staring at each other for short bits of time and then they're grooming then, then they start grooming themselves and then they start ignoring the other cat and in this particular instance it takes about six hours and it's a kind of it's a very hysterical moment in the book for a book that doesn't have a lot it's a it's a dark book and there's for not a lot of comedy the cats actually do provide their own versions of drama and comedy that round out this book very very nicely sorry i definitely need some coffee so we're at rao next up we're going to be talking about folly and this ties back into making a quirky character being deliberately quirky Quir quirky for the sake of quirk should not be used all that often what what is a good indication what is a good way to describe this so hmm a good, a good example of this, where it's just quirky for the sake of quirk, and I'm not saying that I despise this movie, but there is definitely one of those moments where you have to question the logic behind it, which would be Harlequin in the first version of The Suicide Squad. Which is, well, I'm insane, therefore I'm going to do certain things that don't make sense in any form or regard, and, but I'm a badass at the same time, and it just none of it actually seems to track all the way. And she will say certain things because they're funny, 
and met and, e and even from a meta basis, it's funny, but it doesn't make sense for the particular instance that they're in, right? So, folly is these these types of characters. They're called etherealists, which is essentially a wizard. They're, they, Jim Butcher managed to make magic without saying the word magic, right? Everyone describes it as magic. It it, it literally, I believe that at least two of these. I was gonna say at least two at least two of the reviews in and on the book say that oh in this world of machinery and magic and then just you have to explain to them no 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 it's not magic you know what this is believe it or not it is literally just using the currents that are around people so everyone knows that electricity kind of gives off its own currents every and what an etherealist will do is essentially grasp those particular currents and then use them to their own devices so it's really really cool it's an intriguing idea and I love it but you of course can't have that level of power without having a downside. Now the downside is, and again, this becomes almost, you would think that there would be another aspect that you would explore as part of this. Hold on, I have to double check something. What the hell, that was weird. So, you would think that there would be have to be another aspect to explore as part of this, and that would be that makes zero sense. I don't know why I was doing that. Uh, YouTube was giving me false information. So is that uh, using using madness or using insanity as a downside to a power is not the greatest is is not the greatest use of your of the reader's time. In my opinion because madness madness or insanity can be construed as so many things in life that just saying well if he uses this power too much he goes insane then all you're gonna end up doing is you're gonna end up providing loose cannons that no one can fully rely on that you that is just always going to end up you're, you're always have that fear that they're going to betray you that they're going to do something that makes zero sense in the instance. You have to rely on the fact that they are at least sane right now, but you know for, for a fact that at a later date they're going to go insane. And that whole dynamic kind of adds this extra layer of anxiety over the story, and it can distract very much from what you're trying to accomplish. I'm not saying you can't have insane characters. You can. You can actually do them very, very well. And I'm not... I'm not saying that he necessarily did these insane characters badly, but what I will say is that there's a lot of instances where the insanity and the inanity just are kind of there and doesn't fully make sense and doesn't fully follow an existing set of rules. And then when it doesn't follow an existing set of rules, usually the next step in this argument is, well, they're insane, so of course they don't follow a certain set of rules, except the ex insanity is explained using a certain set of rules. So you can get into the, you can get into the discussion and the argument for, for, for as long as you would like, but at the end of the day, it ends up adding an extra detail that isn't necessary. So as part of, an, as part of being an etherealist in this book, since you have access to the etheric currents, what this allows you to do is, um, so you are allowed to harness energy, meaning electricity. So as an example, if uh, in, the, in these books, as opposed to using powder and uh, ball and powder for their guns, they use an electric, uh, electric charge that they stop using the gun when it, they burn through the barrel. So, if someone fires a gun of that nature at an etherealist, they can just use the uh, use the etheric currents to essentially absorb it and then redirect it. It won't ever really hit an etherealist. So, <clears throat> as part of that, though, it means that the so most most people and the way they describe it in the book is that the etheric current will go around people, as an etherealist it goes through people meaning that you can understand how, how the currents work, how they run, how it, it can become, uh, and then how to use them to your advantage in more ways than one. Another aspect of this is that the etheric currents are somehow tied to time, 
bits, meaning that you can see two, you can see short bit, bits into the future, but there's no guarantee that that is the actual future. There's multiple lines that you can kind of drift out towards. And any, so you're bringing in so many different aspects into, <laughs> into this story that can, can somewhat derail what you're, again, what you're trying to portray. So, hold on, I have to double check something. Sorry, I am double checking and triple checking everything, making sure that my stream is actually going according to plan. Awesome, awesome, okay, there we go. Now, go ahead and shove that up, now. Grim, I'm going to go all the way back to Grim. Like I said, this becomes extremely difficult to track because there are so many characters. We go back to Grim. Grim makes his way back to the Spire and has to figure out exactly how he's going to fix his ship because fixing ships in this in this way is very very difficult. Because you, uh, especially in, in this, in his instance, he ended up cracking the actual power crystal. So he has to purchase a new one. And power crystals take forever to grow. So they are very, very expensive. Along these, along this timeline, what ends up happening overall is that the spire gets invaded by an extremely large force from another spire named Aurora. So Aurora invades and then attempts to just essentially cause some damage, at least at the very beginning. That's their overall goal, is they want to they want to blow up the Lancaster Battery so that they can't grow any more power crystals. They want to blow up some of the they want to blow up some of the different well, the, a lot of the different growing locations. They want to blow up a lot of the nobles' houses. Just essentially cause chaos. This initial incursion ends up getting put down, primarily by uh, Grimm, because how the, the Spire does have a standing army, but as part of getting the standing army away is they end up making a very quick attack on some of the docks on the sides of the Spire, uh, Aurora, making some quick attacks on the, on the docks on the side of the Spire and then pulling out, meaning that a bunch of different people needed to jump on to their ships and then go and pursue the, uh, the attacking force leaving only a very minimal amount of the guard, assuming that the actual ship attack was the main attack on the Spire. This in turn allows the Auroran Marines to invade onto the Spire so that they can, uh, onto the Albion Spire so that they can accomplish what they're uh, trying to do. And this is when you're introduced to the next character. Like I said, it gets confusing. His name is Aspera and he is an Auroran Marine. So it's kind of cool looking at it from the outside perspective, especially Aspera, because you find that he is an extremely sympathetic character and he does things because he is told to, which is, as anyone can tell you, not a good look. It sh you sh if, if you're not questioning the orders ever of why someone is, uh, why is someone why why you're doing something, why you're invading this, this particular location, why you're okay with killing, with, with taking the lives of children. I'm trying to not, I'm trying to avoid certain words here. In, in taking the lives of certain children just to, an accompli just to an accomplish an aim, then you're more than likely not a moralistic human being. But again, this fall, it, they don't really discuss the actual, where the morals are derived from. They talk about Christianity, they just call it the religion of the Lord God Almighty, which is indicative of Christianity. And they also talk about certain types of other religions. So there's something called the Way, which is very indicative of almost Buddhism, you know, in certain regards. But so you, yeah, you follow Aspera, and Aspera is uh, you find out what their overall goal is in the uh, in at near the end of the book. But you get to go with him along this journey, and as part of this, you meet the quote unquote uh, enemy etherealist. So. We're going to talk about etherealists a little bit more, because, like I said, there is a, there is a set of rules, but within those rules, there is a significant freedom that the author tries to pursue. So, 
as part of the insanity for each one of these etherealists, there is something that you would qualify as a singular quirk that if they can't, if these particular items or measures are not kept, then they are going to break down and be completely useless to the people that they're around. Making, again, leading back into the loose cannon thing I said earlier. So, one of the characters, Folly, as an example, she has trouble directly addressing people. But she also carries around two jars of something called Lumen Crystals. Now, Lumen Crystals are essentially very, very small versions of the Power Crystals that all they produce is light. And she considers them to be her friends. She actually refers to them as her friends. And so she can't directly talk to someone, but she can describe what's going on to the Lumen Crystals. And then the person who is she is talking to can understand what she's trying to say. So as an example, she spends a lot of time with Bridget. And then Bridget says something along the lines of, oh, we can cross this bridge. And I'm being very general here because it gets deep into the weeds once you actually start reading into it. And then as opposed to say, as opposed to Folly saying to her, oh no, look, the bridge is starting to fall apart. We can't cross the bridge. She'll, she'll look at her Lumen Crystals and say, she'll say, oh, Bridget doesn't realize that the, that the bridge is starting to break and we're gonna have to cross in a different spot. A remarkable, almost barrier that, that Jim Butcher deliberately put up on himself that would make writing this amazingly frustrating because you would have to go back and make sure that this follows the tra that this still follows the traditional line of dialogue because you can't ju you can't just have someone saying something that's com it's not like a movie where someone can say something that's completely insane and then you can derive from context this you need to actually have a way for the person to fully understand what the other person is saying while being indicative of insanity so props to him for I would almost call this a mind exercise. It would drive me up a wall. I would not be able to do it. It would just make me so mad having to deal with it. What this also means is that it can, it really frustrated me as a reader because she breaks the rule for very specific parties, specifically other etherealists she breaks this rule for. Meaning that there are certain things that this particular insane person will break their rules for under this correct set of circumstances. Meaning that they're not truly insane. Honestly, they're not truly insane, but they are insane. And it just becomes almost, it, it's, it's mind boggling. And again, props to Butcher because me as a writer, I highly doubt that I'd be able to actually fully delve into this and then understand and then be able to reread it and then pick up the, uh, pick up the mistakes that I was doing, right? So, there's three etherealists that you know of in these books. You get you get made aware of a fourth one, but he's but he and or she is not there. So you become aware of Folly. You get you become aware of uh, Ferris, who is the Spire Albion's quote unquote master etherealist. I keep saying quote unquote because these words technically really don't exist. He kind of made them up, which is fine because you need to make up words when you're building a building a new world and you you know, you have to fully explain what people are and what people do. So uh Ferris is not nearly as bad as Folly mind-wise, but he has a tendency to not explain things. So he'll just assume that everyone is following his path from point A to point C but he doesn't realize that there's a point B in between there. So he, the point B is his, him, ex, it, him explaining what exactly how he's trying to get there. And when he does, is, when he does, it's even more complicated because you almost get the impression that he doesn't like giving explanations. So you have to give that indicator when he is giving an explanation that he's getting a little frustrated. You can see why, I'm, why this can be almost a turnoff for a lot of average book readers. For me, I enjoy, I enjoy the challenge of a lot of books even though there has been multiple books where I've tried to read them and then I just have to put them down and walk away from them for a while because it just becomes too much. And, but for any, for any Tom, Dick and Harry, let's say, that just wants to pick up a book and enjoy a nice steampunk book, this is probably not your best bet because this can get, this will probably frustrate 
uh, frustrate a lot of people. And again, I might be completely wrong in that. There is any number of things that could take place that uh, that means that you're fully okay with being with with having that level of attention to detail. But the other funny part is, and this actually did gives an indicator that Jim that Jim Butcher was probably thinking that he was going to take this in a different way, is that Ferris also has a quirk, again, best description of it, where he can't use doorknobs. Doorknobs do not, he does not understand doorknobs. He just basically stops and he doesn't fully understand that there is a door in front of him and then in order to get past the door, you need to be able to turn the doorknob. And he makes mention that when he was younger, doorknobs worked. So, what, why this is funny and why this, this, it probably was meant to be something else and ended up becoming what it, what it what it is, which is just labeled as a quirk, is that etherealists will start seeing things in the future without any warning. Meaning that they live part of their lives constantly in the future. They're constantly seeing multiple different results of decisions that are being made. Meaning that a doorknob for someone who lives partially in the future is kind of a hysterical concept because in their mind, they're already past the door. They don't fully understand cause and effect. So having to turn the doorknob in order to open the door makes no sense. The door should just be open. So in that regard, if you wanted to keep it that, I think that would have been amazing. You want to talk about complicated though? That would be extremely difficult to keep track of. You would have to literally think about every single aspect that would be a cause and effect conundrum that you would have to explain by the fact that the etherealist doesn't understand what present is or how to be present. So, pardon, coffee break. So he constantly needs to be around someone to open doors for him, which is a part of the reason why he actually has a uh, apprentice who is falling. Now, the third etherealist that you meet in this book is by the name of Cavendish. Cavendish is not a member of Spire Albion. She's a member of the Spire Aurora. Spoilers, by the way. We're in the spoilers part of this book review. She is a member of, Spy of Spire Aurora. Now, her quirk is that she cannot abide bad manners. Which is funny. But again, it ends up having to add a lot of extraneous words in order to ex explain something that should take a very short time to explain. Because you need to observe niceties whenever you're around her, meaning that any time you ever speak to her, you need to say, excuse me, pardon me for bothering you, do you have the time to? Think It's a lot of just extra. And what that in turn is going to result in is that you're, as opposed to someone going up and saying, the enemy is coming. You have to walk up to her, defer to her, and then say, pardon me, ma'am, I don't mean to bother you. I don't mean to bother you in the middle of your meal, but I would like to be, make you aware that we are currently being evaded by the enemy, which is something very similar to what ends up happening in the book. And if you do not observe the niceties, then she'll go full insane etherealist on you and then probably kill you in multiple in multiple extremely bad ways. So you I, I know it's kind of difficult to understand why I have a full I, I have a bit of a problem with the etherealists. Aside from the fact that they are wizards without being called wizards, which is kind of just a weird a weird cheat code. If, if, you, if you have magic, then, ha then have magic. You don't need to come up with a new magic source. You really don't. But, you know, to, to each their own, I still love the book. It's still, you know, it's still a little bit high on my list, on, on my list of recommendations for anyone who, do who does want to read it. And part of that is because I am, like I mentioned earlier, partial to aesthetic. And I know that's a failing of mine because there's been several movies, TV shows, books, comic books that I just love that aren't necessarily technical masterpieces. And the reason I love it is because of the aesthetic. Cyberpunk 2077 is a perfect example of that. I love the cyberpunk aesthetic. A lot of cybernetics, uh, uh, you know, talking with your, uh, talking with uh, communications that are installed in your brain, uh, having, in, uh, having enhancements via mechanics. So I love 
I also love the steampunk aesthetic. You notice there's a lot of punk in here. I um, and the steampunk aesthetic is lots of dark woods, lots of elect uh, electricity that is being provided by steam and crystals and things of and things like that. Steamships, uh, not steamships, sail uh, sailing ships that go through the air being elevated by said crystals. Always a lot of fun. So the aesthetic of this book is perfect, especially for someone like me. But that does not remove the fact that there are issues. Same thing, so, you know, going back to Cyberpunk 2077, the story is kind of basic. It is. There's a lot of things that they promised that didn't end up happening. So the decisions that you make don't fully affect what the result is going to be, as opposed to a lot of other things where little decisions will end up making a big impact at the end. There's not really that in Cyberpunk 2077. So just, and here, there are issues. Primarily speaking, too too many characters to follow, for most people. And again, I still rank I still rank this book positively. I still think it's worth a read before I go into the criticisms. And like I said, quirky characters for the sake of being quirky can just get very frustrating, and be, and then in turn become uh, has frustration throughout the book, right? Let's go through some positives though. Some positives are is that he does extreme Jim Butcher overall has always done extremely good character work and he does extremely good character work despite there being so many characters you know how each of these characters acts and you you know how they're going to react to certain situations and he doesn't just do that by saying it except for one instance and um, it's very very brief and one of the characters Benedict is talking about Gwen who I mentioned earlier Gwen Lancaster and um, uses the term Gwenish and then has to explain what Gwenish means to a standard uh, to a person standing by and what it essentially is is that he again he's using his, he's using her name as a descriptor which probably not the greatest move because that takes away from the showmanship of how to actually develop a character but aside from that and it's one it's one thing that's very very brief Aside from that, all the rest of the characters, you learn th their characteristics, sorry for the redundancy, by watching them interact and by watching them do and watching them just interact with the world. And you can derive how the characters would act here by watching, which is just amazingly perfect. I love when you can show me something and not have to say, well, this person's quirky. It, it, I don't. I don't, I don't need that description. All I need is for you to show me why they're quirky. Show me how they're quirky. And then we can actually have, and then we can have an actual debate about how the characters are gonna act. So he does a very good job in that form. He also does a very good job in not dragging out the description of how the world works. A lot of the time when you come across books that are trying to establish new worlds, you can really get, speaking from personal experience, you can get really lost in the weeds trying to establish how this world works, which is often a critique of Tolkien, where they're saying that there is a lot of descriptors and there's a lot of how his world works. Difference is, is that he, when, whenever you talk about the first, when it comes to high level fantasy, Tolkien has to be on that list of one of the first people to write it so when you're when you're trying something that no one has ever done before then you can allow a little bit of leeway and there's not a hell of a whole lot of books like this there are there are steampunk books but he's establishing a world and not being overly detailed in how the world be, came to be he actually doesn't tell you all he says is that the surface is uninhabitable. And he actually tells you that by talking about the result of an action. Specifically at the very beginning where Grimm is fighting for the uh, fighting for the merchant vessel near the very, very beginning. He talks about if the ship, sh his ship should be shot down, he would go to the surface, which is uninhabitable. And he talks about why it's uninhabitable. He didn't just start at the very beginning and then give a long description of how the world works. Which is awesome. 
and it's difficult to do. So, definitely a pro. Defi definitely a good a uh, uh, little little d uh, ding in the pro column for that, because for any book, you want to under you want to understand to be immersed in the world. But you also don't want to just be told, well, this is how this works, this is how this works, this is how this works. You want to watch it in action. So, there's that. There is also a really good amount of political intrigue intermingled with the action. I know that sounds weird, and I've only ever read maybe one of the books that does it very well. And it uh, it's a book about it's a, a, a book essentially if the civil war was fought with magic and it can it can it can be a little confusing when done by someone who doesn't understand how that how that life works because what you're what you end up doing is you end up focusing too much on the politics and not enough on the action or vice versa but when you can perfectly blend it together and then the action fights alongside of the political intrigue, then it's good. And it's not like, oh my gosh, these people are here so that they can overturn. And it's like, you know, it's not them being said, it's what the actions are, which leads you to the conclusion of what they're trying to do. So props to Jim Butcher on that one as well. Finally, what I will also say is that it's actually, a, I know this seems like a, like a doki chunk, a doki chunker, a donkey choker, but for what it is, it's actually not all that long and it, it's, it, it's an easier read. There's not, there's not a heck of a whole lot of understanding of different vocab words that you've just completely passed over when you were when you were in elementary school that you kind of have to go back and look at. And there's not a glossary at the end explaining, uh, explaining everything. He does a very good job at making this digestible to people. So, I, I appreciate that, especially when you're trying something new that no one else has really done before. At least none that I've found that have done it well. So it allows me to actually enjoy the book and not have to go back and forth and try to figure out what exactly this is, why it's this way. And because I've, I've run across books like that where you have this enormous glossary at the back and you have to go look at the back or else you have zero idea of what's going on. Essentially the novel version of Warhammer because anyone who says that they understand all of Warhammer, I don't believe you. Just, I mean, off the top of your head. You can easily read it in the book and then understand it and then comprehend it. But by that same token, I don't fully understand every aspect of D&D. I know a lot about it, but I couldn't just off the top of my head tell you the dynamics or how things work. It just wouldn't work that way. So, all right. There's that, there's that. Final, final thing that I would like to say about it is that comprehensively, it's, it's dark. It's, so in, in steampunk, there is, there can be a little bit of an issue of auth, uh, auteurs leaning into the ridiculousness of the world that they've created, which is not a bad thing, but it definitely makes for a lot more of a light-hearted adventure as opposed to understanding the, the fact that you're involved in a life or death struggle, which this entire book is a life and death struggle. It is. No matter what, no, what, no matter what anyone tells you, there is just, even when they're making light of the situations that they're stuck in, you know, for, you know, extremely well, the fact that there is going to, there's a high possibility that they won't make it. So he doesn't get lost in the weeds on that which I appreciate. And he probably got a little bit of help when, when writing Dresden because urban fantasy beforehand can have a tendency to almost lean into that ridiculousness. You know, they, you don't want to take yourself too seriously, but you also don't want to create something that is um, almost kitty and uh, more aligned with a, a young adult novel. And I mean, I was also pulling that off of a young adult novel with Cassandra Clare. I like, more, I like the Mortal Instruments books, but definitely, I think it would have been a lot more interesting if she had made it more for adults. So this is definitely not 
not a children friendly book. A lot of stuff happens in here. And I wouldn't even call it a, um, there, I don't think there's any kind of sexual, ex, ex, uh, sexual content in here. There, there is reference to it. So as an example, Bridget gets kidnapped and she makes a comment about, well, what happens next? And the person looks at, him, uh, looks at her and says, well, what do you think happens next? And she says, usually rape and murder. Um, so, rape and murder, sorry. And um, so there's references to it, but there's never anything that's outright, this is going to happen. And I'm going to, this is going to be described to you in vivid detail, which has existed in books and can be done tastefully and can be done well in order to portray the feeling of that situation. But Jim Butcher didn't feel the need to, which I actually kind of appreciate because if, if I had one suggestion for anyone who really wanted to understand the grotesqueness of certain almost nihilistic level levels of books. Reading George R. R. Martin's uh, Song of Fire and Ice novels, there's some moments where you kind of have to sit back and go, this, this is just unpleasant. And so you, you have to decide whether or not the unpleasantness is worth it because you enjoy the story that much. I, I never enjoyed the story of the Song of Ice and Fire enough to explore it. I got through, I think, half of the first book and I just, it just didn't appeal to me. I, I, I use, I use books to get away from the darkness that's life. And when that one just takes you and shoves you right back, I don't find it worth it. Thankfully, what this does, and it's probably because of the juxtaposition of how different this world is, because this, this, this book is very dark as well, but it's not nihilistic. It's not. There's, there's a lot of hopelessness. I would call it more almost, uh, no, uh, almost close to noir, where, and I'm talking about the traditional version of noir, which is, you know that no matter how much good you do, that there's always going to be some level of darkness there after you're done. So a little bit of history lesson. Noir came from post, it started pre-World War or World War II, but primarily post-World War II, because there was always this fear wrapped in, up in the fact that atomic bombs existed. Before atomic bombs existed, there, you, you know, you could be bombed, you could be invaded, there's any number of things that could happen, but there was never this ultimate feeling that everything was gonna end. And then something that could blow up entire cities in one go, appeared. And then it developed into the genre where, no, again, no matter what you do, you know that there's always the possibility that tomorrow everyone is gonna die. Everyone that you know is, gonna pa is just gonna pass in an extremely violent way. So this, lean, this book leans into that. Kinda hard, especially near the end. And you don't fully realize it until you get to that point where you go, wow, they are suffering a lot in a lot of different ways because each one of the characters, like I've said previously, are so well characterized that you can witness that you witness them witnessing an event and know how they're feeling near the end because of it. Which is any author's dream, right? You want to be able to create something that anyone can pick up and understand the characters that you see in your own head, which is always a good barrier to entry. If you read it and you know for a fact that there's a lot of stuff that you're shoving in there that the reader won't know, well, that's stuff that you still have to, that you're shoving in there from your brain, but the reader won't know, then it's probably time for a couple of rewrites. Also, issue is is that on the other end of that, if you if you end up creating a book that is a door stopper, then you also should probably edit some out and then figure out what exactly those details are. So. Almost noir steampunk, which I really love. It's it's a nice it's a nice blending. And I know that there's probably gonna be one technical person out there who wants to call me out on it. This is just my own personal opinion throughout all of this. This is you can you can say you can hate this book, you can love this book, you can have you can have apathy towards this book. This is just my own viewpoint. And I wanna bring some attention to books that I believe are worth a read. 
That's the entire purpose of the of this particular hour-long show. So, but anyway, no one chimed in, which is fine. What I will ask is that um, this is going uh, this stream is going to get unlisted, and then it's going to be recorded, and then the recording of it is going to go up on the channel. So, if you have something to say. I would really appreciate it if you would actually comment down below on that video and then you and I or whomever can actually have a discussion about the book. You can even have a discussion about how you think I missed so much of the book because this is, an, oh, this is only an hour long. I don't want to completely bore people. I want people to have a basic grasp of how the book works and the characters in the book so that you would decide whether or not you think it's worth your time. That's all I want. If you enjoyed this, I would also appreciate if you hit the like button both here and over there, I would really, really appreciate it just so that this can end up getting out to as many people as, uh, as they can, just so that more people read. I want everyone to read. I, I, it's, it's, we call it a life's goal. I want everyone to be able to pick up any book, read it, and then comprehend it. And what that requires is finding books that you love and then getting all the way through them so that you can read books that you wouldn't necessarily read, but find out, find if you enjoy them or not. That's it. So, I really appreciate it. Also, if you really enjoyed this, I would really appreciate if you hit the subscribe button, the follow button, where the, wherever this ends up, so that, so that you never actually miss when I do this again. I'm gonna be doing this again next Saturday. I really hope to see, uh, see any, anyone who joined there at that time as well. I'm probably gonna do the second half of Empire of Silence. And, but until that time, thank you everyone for who came in and who showed a little bit of love. I, I fully appreciate it. And, um, but I, I love all of you. Be sure I'm not the only one who tells you that. I hope you have yourself a great rest of your weekend, okay?